Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It's a delight to be here today for all of the people that are fascinated with ESP, psychic phenomenon, that really are interested in putting together the pieces of the puzzle, that are looking for scientific evidence. We finally have that coming together today. We've invited Diane Hennessy Powell, MD, the author of The ESP Enigma, The Scientific Case for Psychic Phenomenon to its Rainmaking Time. She is also a medical doctor who studied at John Hopkins University in medicine, neuroscience, and psychiatry. She has actually taught at Harvard University, and she participated in a project on consciousness at the Jonas Salk Institute. She has studied with Sir Michael Rudder at the Maudsley Hospital in London, England, and also at Queen's Square. Diane is used to studying with the greatest thinkers on the planet. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Diane Hennessy Powell to its rainmaking time. Good day. Thank you, Kim. It's a pleasure to be here. What is this book about, and what is it supposed to accomplish? This is a huge undertaking. It was a huge undertaking. And the reason that I undertook it was that on my own, I became really curious about these phenomena that as a neuroscientist, the model that I was operating under didn't explain. It just wasn't possible. So I was curious, and I would, on my own, start to research and, and conceptualize and try to figure out, first of all, is there enough evidence for ESP? You know, and by that, we're talking about telepathy. We're talking about precognition. We're talking about the ability to have our consciousness affect the physical world. And I wanted to know... Is there evidence for these things? And then once I saw that there was, I wanted to know, how is that possible? And I'm a very fortunate person in that I was a mathematical prodigy. I was doing ninth grade math when I was seven years old. And I took graduate courses in physics as an undergraduate just for fun. And that that came easy to me. I, my father was a scientist. I have a brother who's a theoretical physicist. It's just in my it's, it's just in my uh, heritage, and it's also in my heritage to question with an open mind. And what I found was that it's actually possible to understand these phenomena that neuroscience has basically ignored because they, even though the data is better for their being uh, telepathy or, or um, precognition, the, the data is actually better than it is for the data that says that taking aspirin on a daily basis is going to help you prevent um, a heart attack or you know, a stroke. The evidence is better, yet you find science, mainstream science rejecting you know, th that evidence. And why is that? It's because they don't really have a way that it fits with their model. It is just, it's, it's like taking people back when they thought that the, the earth was flat or, or that the sun, you know, that revolved around the earth rather than the other way around. It's, it's, it's such a change in, in paradigm that um, most neuroscientists have not been able to grapple with this stuff, so they just shoved aside. Well, after a while, that evidence just keeps mounting, and you can't shove it aside anymore. And as a true scientist, I was, I, I was not going to shove it aside. I said, okay, let's look at it. I looked at it, looks good, and then I thought... Wow, okay, now, what is the simplest way of trying to understand this, given what we know about um, not throwing out, you know, what we know from neuroscience, not throwing out anything else? Can we understand this? And, and we can. I mean, modern physics allows us to explain some of these things. I mean, it's not, 
Um, it's not in violation of any of the laws within science. It's just that we have to think more broadly about these things. We have to bridge across scientific disciplines. We can't just think, you know, think narrowly. We have to actually realize that, you know, what we are is our, you know, our consciousness is an interface with this, um, with this universe, and we need to understand that interface. And so that's, that's what my book's about. And, and once I started to find the connections and a way of understanding that and a model for understanding that, I felt I need to write this book. I need to write it so that people can understand it, so that scientists can read it, and they won't argue with my scientific um, argument because it's all everything that I say is scientifically grounded in science. You know, in fact, it's not that I'm you know pulling out something and and making a huge leap from you know one thing to another. So scientists appreciate it. Lay people written it for them so that they can read it and go, oh my gosh, you know, I, I, I can understand science. And, and that science actually helps me to understand things that I experience, but I just kind of shove aside because that's not what I was taught in school um, or I never knew how to articulate it. So, so I felt like everybody, you know, whether they were scientists or people who experienced these things, that everybody could benefit from having someone who could just pull the two together because not many people bridge those two worlds. Those two worlds have been so separate for for so long. That was quite a feat. I will tell you that I read a lot, and this is the first book of its kind in my experience where there are so many aspects and subjects that are tied together. They're separate, but they're connected. And they're laid out in such a way where you explain what something is, then you give the actual data. And it's very neutral. And usually books aren't that neutral. I was waiting for the push one way or the other, and I couldn't find one. (laughs) And I was thinking to myself, for somebody that doesn't understand these subjects or these areas or wants to delve into it and learn more or learn what the latest science is finding about it, this is a compendium of great information synthesized for the public. And you don't really have to be a scientist because you explain it. But I can see for the scientist it would be critical. Yeah, I, well, thank you. I, that was, I really, I'm not trying to sell anything. You know, I'm, I'm really not trying to sell anybody on something. I, in that sense, I don't have an agenda what I wanted to do is create for people an opportunity for them to experience what I experienced, but make it easier for them. They don't have, uh, you know, 20 years to be reading everything that's out there, doing their own research, et cetera, et cetera. They don't have that kind of time or background. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to try to just distill things for people so that they can make up their own mind. That's what I loved from, about it. Make it up from a, you know, a, a good, sound basis as opposed to believing something just because that's what they were taught they should believe. Well, that's what I loved about it because I noticed that while I was reading the book, I was doing a lot of thinking about the subjects that you were mentioning and talking about, like precognition, like the past, the present, and the future all coexisting all these different aspects on kind of a wheel of understanding. But what I loved was the recent research you were mentioning. Let's talk about some of them, can we? Sure. Sure. On page 87, you wrote about how neuroscientists already knew that the unconscious brain perceives events before they reach our conscious awareness because the first level of processing 